Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to call to order um, our PVUSD board meeting for this evening, and we have translation available in Spanish. If you need translation services, please see Virginia Gonzalez in the back there. Um, if someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, then you must complete a speaker card and hand it in to Eva Renteria uh, prior to the start of the agenda item. So each speaker will have two minutes, and we know that sometimes, you know, just, I know if most of you have heard this, but just to reiterate, you know, it's, we know it's easy to lose track of time. So Vice President Shocker has a little 30 second warning card just that she'll hold up so that you can wrap up your thoughts and end and, and, and give other people time to speak. Um, so it will go to item 3.2, our Pledge of Allegiance. And um, Trustee Acosta, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? To the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we will move on to item 3.3, our superintendent comments. So Dr. Rodriguez, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, we had um, thank you to um, President Holm, Vice President um, Shocker, and Trustee Orozco for being at the State of the District. We had a great State of the District on um, last week. Um, I'm gonna be showing a video, which a two minute video, which we created for that event. And we actually, I also, Used, I presented in front of the National Health Organization this past Monday and um, they were really impressed with the work that we're doing around wellness centers and with our partners. And I just wanted to note before you see this video that this video was, you're gonna think, well, wow, it's so well done, it must be done professionally. Well, it was done somewhat professionally um, by our CTE teachers. So two of our CTE teachers were the ones who helped um, film this and edit it together. And so if you'd be able to put it up, that would be great. And I hope you enjoy this video around what we're doing. Whole child, whole family, whole community is an expansion of our original focus on the whole child, which began in 2019. As an educational community, we are more committed than ever to cultivate the passions, interests, and talents of each and every child, strengthen our social emotional well being, and lift them up through an expanded definition of student success so they reach their unlimited potential. We value the support of our families that they give their children every day and recognize the impact of this care on our community's collective well-being. Oh, nice, yeah. Do you get to color in Educating the whole child means that we are able to connect with the mind and the body and the vibrancy and the life within us and that we are able to really nurture children through a connection with their own emotions, their ability to articulate those emotions, and their ability to be able to be agents of their own life, to have agency, to feel that they belong, and that to feel that their identity is in, as important as anyone else's. As an educator, it's immensely important that I have some sort of connection with families because this is what's going to allow students to feel supported, not just at school, not just on campus, but also at home. As we grow, have our family grow and flourish with us. That encouragement is what truly unites us and that's really what's gonna uplift our community. That's what's gonna allow our students to say, I wanna stay and be the leader that they can be. Own being bilingual, own having their accents, embracing who they are and their identities and bringing their culture to the table. Put on set, sound, Speaking. camera, Scene four, take three, marker. 
What I want for PVUSD students is the same as what all of PVUSD's partners want. We want our students to thrive. We want our students to have the skills they need to be successful. We also want them to have the relationships that will encourage them forward. We want students to feel connected to job opportunities, to understand that college can be for them if they want it. We want students to have a sense of incredible opportunity. And that happens in an ecosystem where all of us partners can come together with the district. PVUSD are students, families, and staff are further supported by an ecosystem of over 60 community partner organizations. Thank you. All right, so yay. Um, so we'll move on to item 3.4, our governing board comments. Uh, this is our opportunity for board members to make comments and we'll start with uh, Trustee DeSerpa. I'll defer tonight, thank you. Okay, Trustee Soto? Yeah, as well, I'll defer, thanks. Okay. Trustee Dodge Jr.? I'd just like to thank everybody for being here at this meeting. Uh, I attended the Watsville High School Booster Club earlier this evening and go cats, thank you very much. Trustee Acosta. Um, thank you, um, I just uh, wanted to take a moment if we could and recognize um, before our next board meeting, we will have Thursday, November 11th, which is our uh, Veterans Day. So I would just like to recognize and honor all the men and women of service who served our country, including our very own Trustee Soto. Thank you for your service. And um, just to those families, um, our students and families and members of our community that will be participating in um, Halloween this Sunday, I just wish you all um, a safe and happy hunting Halloween. Thank you. And Trustee Orozco. Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so it's been a couple of busy weeks for me. Uh, we started off with the green team meeting, uh, which is our district-wide committee. Um, and so we're making um, some, uh, we're moving forward with a couple of things. We formed a couple of committees focused around um, uh, not only looking at you know what uh, each of our schools have in terms of the type of initiatives um, being implemented at each school um, and also the needs at each school uh, so that that information then informs uh, the type of uh, direction that we as a committee will be taking on moving forward. Um, so it's exciting work. I also attended the state of the district um, the state of the district and uh, it's always great to see not only our administrators present but also just the community partners uh, present and working together uh, to really uh, provide families with those around, around services um, that we know they need. Um, I also want to thank the community. Um, I know we had a couple of our employers too. Employees uh, participate um, and attend the evening with the mayor and friends of Watsonville Parks and Community Services. So I do want to thank the larger community who have, to date have sponsored a banner or a light pole decoration for downtown. Um, is it looks like we um, have actually maximized the number of banners that can go up. So we're actually um, opening other streets uh, to, uh, to other families and uh, local businesses who want to contribute uh, to that initiative. And we also uh, have opened our Bridge to Wellness Fund application for families, PBOSD families to apply to. This is um, essentially a grant um, that families can apply to who are facing an emergency situation. So that opened last week and I think as of today, we had over 28 um, entries. Um, so we're hopeful that if uh, this is successful, that we can continue to expand upon the number of families that we can service through this initiative. Um, and of course, uh, we wanna thank all the community uh, members and families who donated uh, to make this fund happen for families. 
And lastly, I just want to thank our special education team, Casey, Heather, uh, Duncan Holbert, and the team at WIXA. My son just graduated from um, speech language therapy. Um, and so it's been uh, the hard work of the past three years and it couldn't have been possible without the support of those teams. So I just want to acknowledge the amazing work and the amazing support system that your team provides to not only my son, but kids across the district. Um, so thank you. And with that, again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Vice President Shocker. Thank you, President Holm. So yes, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Carmona's Restaurant and Watsonville Booster Club for hosting um, the booster fundraiser for the Wildcats. So go cats. <laughs> um, also want to let you know that Watsonville Pal has um, started offering some free programs to our community and um, they're going to be doing hip-hop dance classes, folklorical dance, um, which our own Ruby Vasquez is going to be helping with, um, a Latin dance, and they also do a teen martial arts class and those are free programs. I think it's $15 for the year, but they do have waivers for families that can't pay that. Um, yes, we had our green team committee meeting and we're off to a good start um, talking about how we can decrease our carbon footprint here at PVUSD. Um, we also had our state of the district um, where we got to hear about the things that are coming in this upcoming year and progress that we've made. Um, we had our DALAC committee meeting for English language learners. And then also there's a trunk or treat this weekend at the Watsonville Fairgrounds. PVUSD is one of the partners Partners, so bring your children by, come and visit. And downtown Watsonville at the Plaza will also have one on Saturday. And these are free events for children and community members. So thank you. Thank you. And you know, I also attended the State of the District and you know our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting. And um, you know, there's there's a lot of work you know, that we need to do as a district, and there's also some really beautiful things happening. And so both the state of the district and, you know, our, our foundation are, are just really good, poignant reminders of, you know, the successes that we are having. And one of the things about this district that I am excited about is our project. You know, the, I, I know I've, I've mentioned it at many meetings, but our um, Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen project, and that continues to move forward and gain momentum. And through the generosity of many community partners, that is, you know, moving forward. And we have some additional donations. Uh, Dane Skirich, uh, $500. Julie Edwards, $100. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, um, $750. The Camacho family, $500. Deborah Fried a hundred dollars and Carmen and Andy Kumasaka uh, $500 and it just gets us closer to having that goal of a project that supports the you know physical and mental health of our students which is wonderful all right so we will move on to item 3.5 our introduction of our 2021 2022 student trustee and the administration of our symbolic oath. So Dr. Rodriguez, do you want to present on this? Yeah, thank you. So each year we have the pleasure of having a student trustee. Um, it's quite the extensive process, so we do a, a call out to students to decide who wants to um, be part of that process. They do come in and they interview with us. It's always some of my favorite interviews of the year. Um, and so this year they interviewed with um, Ms. Chouse, um, myself, and also um, Ms. Jimenez, um, and we had really great candidates this year, just like we always do. Um, we try to find someone that we feel um, per will provide a diverse point of view, and so this year um, we're really proud of the person that we selected and feel that it's going to be um, a wonderful representation of student voice on the board. And so I will pass it on to you to administer the oath. All right, so if you will join me at the podium at the front. First of all, it's you, welcome. Thank you. All right, and so I, Jennifer Holm, president of the Board of Trustees of PBUSD, 
do hereby certify that Ms. Sanchez was officially appointed as a student trustee at our October 27th, 2021 meeting of the board. So if you'll raise your right hand and repeat after me. So I, I, Itzy Sanchez, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will defend the Constitution of the United States, that I will defend the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, domestic and foreign, foreign. <laughs> Sorry. that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, and I will well and faithfully, discharge the duties, discharge the duties, upon which I am about to enter, upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. So welcome aboard. All right. Um, so moving on to item 3.6. Um, our high school students uh, board representatives report. Uh, do we have a presentation from Diamond Tech, a video? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna do both. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll do Go ahead, Watsonville, come on up. Sorry, I mixed up my order, my apologies. It's all right. Uh, just before we start, I'd like to confirm I have this clicker. Does it work? Or? It should. Yes. <laughs> uh, I just, before I start, and <laughs> happy to be able to say that we're in person now. I did this all last year from my bedroom, and now I feel really, really happy that I'm able to do it here and see everyone's faces. So, hello. My name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez. I'm the student representative from Watsonville High School, and I'm here to talk to you today about how we've sort of returned to in-person learning, the way that we've continued all of these different activities, from athletics to clubs to different events hosted by ASB and more people. So now I want to talk a little bit about athletics. So our sports are back in full force. The girls' tennis team has actually won our league's championship, and our uh, very own freshman, Caitlin Ruiz, has, has taken first place in multiple races throughout the entire county. Our football team in our annual game against PVSD, uh, P against PVSD, against PV High School, Pajaro Valley High School, has able, uh, the Belgard Cup, was able to keep the Belgard Cup home. And the girls' volleyball team recently celebrated their senior night, and I believe they had their last game either yesterday or tonight, so we're very happy about that. And girls' golf has completed their season very strong. Uh, as for campus life, we've been able to continue tons and tons and tons of different clubs and events, from Saga Club to ICANN Club to Mata to MSA. So many different clubs have ended up in Watsonville High School and have really shown the diversity of thoughts and beliefs that we have at our school. And a lot of new clubs have begun this year from people, um, let me just adjust this, from people who are just entering Watsonville High School for the first time in person. We had a freshman star at uh, Dungeons and Dragons Club, and we have other different uh, uh, students starting their clubs, sharing their interests, getting together, and really being able to come together in a way that for me is really, really impressive, especially after um, distance learning. We were able to celebrate quite a few different occasions in this time since we started. Uh, we celebrated the 16 de September, uh, that was hosted in honor of S National Hispanic Heritage Month, and that was hosted with the aid of Mata, MSA, and the Mexican American community we had at Watsonville High School. Uh, we were also able to celebrate National Coming Out Day with an entire week of activities, from giving out flags to students, and also uh, our actual coming out ceremony that we hosted in the and ASB is moving forward with our homecoming activities. So uh, we actually had a parade today, and so the parade 
uh, was able to, uh, we sort of went around all of downtown Watsonville and cruised through Watsonville High School, showing the hard work of tons of different clubs, academies, and all of our different classes. Our theme this year is animal kingdoms, so different sort of animal kingdoms from uh, the ocean to the jungle to the desert. Each class is sort of uh, chose a theme and they're hosting things related to this theme. Now I want to talk a little bit about the struggles that we've had upon returning to in-person learning because uh, despite all of these good things that have come about, there have been quite a few um, issues that we've had to face. Uh, a lot of students upon returning to school has faced a lot of mental health issues. There's a lot of anxiety with actually returning to the classroom and being around so many people. And thankfully, our wellness center and our new social emotional counselor, Ms. Medina, have been able to help out. We really appreciate, we really, really appreciate having Ms. Medina at our school and having our own centers here. They've been amazing. But we're just wondering what the district is doing to ensure that schools have these sufficient social emotional resources because despite all of the support that we've been getting, there still have been uh, quite a few students who have been struggling this whole semester really and have been having a lot of difficulty adjusting and I feel for them. Alongside that, we are really, really thankful that teachers got an increase in substitute pay. And I believe it was an hourly increase from sixty to eighty dollars. I'm not entirely sure either that or forty to sixty dollars. I forgot the exact statistic. We're really thankful for that. However, we're wondering what exactly or what steps the district is taking to ensure that we fill all these teacher vacancies and that we're able to account for uh, absences from teachers and to make sure that these teachers get fair compensation for the time they're taking out of their preparation period. Alongside that, Watsonville High School has begun increasing its gender neutral bathrooms. We've recently, uh, we are st we've started the process of converting some teachers and staff bathrooms to gender neutral bathrooms for our students and staff alike. Uh, in our art, in our art building, we have a teacher's restroom that's being, a staff restroom that's being converted to a gender neutral bathroom, and we believe that this this is really really good. However, uh, there are some facilities on <laughs> our campus that are still lacking such as uh, gender neutral changing stations or locker rooms, facilities that ensure equal access for gender non-conforming students. And so we're wondering what steps and initiatives the district are taking to ensure that all students, gender non-conforming students, non-binary students, transgender students are able to get equal access to all of these facilities in order to make sure that we as a community, as a PVSD community, are able to feel safe and included in all different circumstances. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. All right. Go Cats. <laughs> so, so now we'll go for our Diamond Tech uh, uh, video. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. My name is Adriana Jimenez Espinosa, and I am a current Diamond Tech senior and also the ASB president at Diamond Tech. We are excited to catch you up on everything we have been doing since school started. At the beginning of the school year, Diamond Tech was recognized for a national gold medal for college and career preparation, even during distance learning, using Get Focus, Stay Focus school wide. We have posted a September 1st article on our school website. Diamond was also recognized in the Lookout Santa Cruz article regarding the Business CT pathway and a partnership with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. Diamond Tech's character education themes for this year are unity, empathy, imagination, and ambition. Each quarter, the student council and staff identify students who are recognized for these characteristics. Speaking of unity, being back on campus this year has given us the opportunity to unify and connect. Because of ELO funding and in partnership with Digital Nest, Devin was able to offer our incoming ninth and current 10th graders a leadership summit. The focus was on getting our new ninth graders ready through goal setting, team building, and preparation for success at Diamond. This was then carried through our day one and two sessions for the beginning of the school and our launch of Zone to Grow. Day one and two are focused on revealing the school theme for the year. This year's theme is from the seven habits of highly effective people. We are celebrating habit number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. It's about listening with empathy, empathy, which is one of our character F themes as well. The new executive director, Eva Brooks, a year future is our business, and Diamond have successfully been able to bring back the 10th and 11th grade mentorship program. 
We have more mentors than ever. Both the students and mentors have met twice. This is an extremely important and valuable program for us techies. We have a lot of school activities since the beginning of school. Our beach volleyball team is doing really well. We won our last four games and will hopefully be in the playoffs in December. Let's go White Tigers. We always celebrate September 16th in style at Diamond. It was a fun spirit week with mass decorating, traditional dress, and lots of school spirit. Diamond Tech is currently in the middle of our Halloween spirit week with a week full of fun and games. Really looking forward to Mummy Dogs again this year. Halloween is a big deal at Diamond and we are looking forward to seeing the costumes on Friday. We had our most successful La Pulga this year with over 25 vendors. The student council and the senior class made about $1,000 together. And students were even out there selling their own creations this year. Again, another successful Diamond Tech fundraiser for students. Our entire school took our first field trip since fall 2019. It was a blast. We went to Harley Farms, which is a sustainable goat cheese farm in a beautiful setting. We learned about sustainable livestock farming, business management of a small local farm, and took some beautiful photos of the property. Our upcoming events include, include a virtual college visit from the Academy of Arts tomorrow, academic interviews for the 9th and 10th graders, our college and career fair on November 17th, an eighth grade experience where we invite our eighth grade charters to a day of project-based learning. World Series of Innovation Challenge submissions are coming up in December. WSI is where all Diamond Tech students create a business aligned with the United Nations goals for a better world and enter a worldwide competition. Last year, two of our teams made it to the top 10. This battle and social media marketing challenge will also launch when we update. We will update when the submissions are ready. This year, we have been truly blessed with angel donations. An anonymous donor through the Community Foundation, Santa Cruz County, reached out to donate $10,000 towards new laptops for our, for our incoming ninth graders. Our partner, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, also reached out and purchased Lookout Santa Cruz subscriptions for all students and the teachers to support literacy in the classroom. Thank you to these partnerships as they really do make a difference to our school. Our team will launch Adopt a Family this November. We'll be collecting donations for a family in need from our district. This will be the fifth year of this community service project since which was started by one of our alumni in 2016. Lastly, we would like to thank PVSD for the care packages of students' materials and masks. We got our new diamond shirts that day. It was an unexpected surprise. Thank you again for the opportunity to share what we have been doing at Diamond Tech. If you would like to know more on what our school is doing, please don't hesitate to stop by our website or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and come check it out. All right. We'll move on to item 4.1, our approval of agenda. Uh, can I have a motion to approve our agenda? I move to approve. All right, I have a first. Do I have a second? A second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. All right, moving on to item 5.1, approval of the October 13th, 2021 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, we will move on to item 6.1, our Pajo Valley Federation of Teachers, our sunshine proposal to uh, Pajo Valley Unified School District for our collective bargaining agreement negotiations 2021-2022 school year. And that report will be presented by Allison Niazawa, our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Yes, thank you, President Holm, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, um, and the public. It's a public hearing to announce that we are entering into negotiations with PVFT. Um, we are in a reopener year, um, which means that between the two parties, we will um, reopen wages and related matters, health and welfare benefits, and if, if either side choose, uh, three additional articles um, in this year. So right now for you tonight, I have the sunshine proposal from PVFT, which is to sunshine the wages and related matters article, um, which also is inclusive of all the salary schedules for the bargaining unit members that they represent. Will you 
So we have some public speakers to this item. So Maria, would you please call up the first three? Sure. Let me. I'm sorry if I butcher your name. <laughs> Says so uh, Travis Walk or Walker Walker. Followed by um, Caroline West. Um, I'll probably speak again later, so I'll do my best to keep it short. Um, oh, can you not hear me? Hello? Does that work? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to speak on this agenda item uh, real quickly. Um, I used to teach economics. I never was super great at economics. But do understand simple concepts like inflation. Inflation since our last... Uh, negotiation has been around 5%. They gave us 5% for a COLA raise. Um, this board has proposed using some of that money to pay for SROs. If we don't receive that whole 5%, you're essentially giving us a pay cut. I want that to be made clear. 5% should be the absolute minimum. And even that won't be good enough. I'm Carolyn West. Hello, board. Hello, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm one of the nurses, and um, I'm here in support of the nurses and also the teachers, the certificated staff. Um, we're two nurses short right now. Um, it is really hard for us to attract nurses here to the district um, when they can make more money clinically. Uh, plus, it's really expensive to, to live in this area. I came here from the Central Valley, and it's just unbelievable. <laughs> So we, we do have to stay competitive with other districts. We've been trying to attract other nurses recently. We, we even had one good one really lined up and she decided to stay where she was at Sutter. So we really do have to remain competitive um, to attract quality staff. Um, with COLA, it's just, it's just really important um, to be able to do that. Um, I, you know, I'm not thinking about myself, but I'm thinking about our our health services, our teachers, our staff. Um, we, we just want to have quality people. Our, our students deserve that. They deserve to have quality staff and people who can um, be able to, to live without worry. And also teachers pay for so many things themselves too. <laughs> That's the other thing. But um, I, I just really hope you'd support this. It, it isn't a, you know, no, nobody goes into education for, for big <laughs> <laughs> but we, we have to be able to survive. Um, thank you. Elizabeth Thorne and Radhika Kirkman. Why, hello, board. And hello, Dr. Rodriguez. And hello, our new student trustee. Hello. I'm Elizabeth Thorne, I'm the nurse at Watsonville High. You guys already knew that. I've been in this district longer than any other nurse who's been in this district, okay? So I am gonna say that being two nurses down and granted one of them, the why is because we have a nurse who went out early on, on pregnancy leave, yay for her. But we are suffering a little bit. Our illustrious assistant superintendent says that the nurses are not doing much for COVID. We're only responsible for doing maybe a few calls. Guess what? That's not what's happening. We are shorthanded. Even though we were supposed to get nine HCAs, we did not get nine HCAs, okay? So anyway, that's not my topic right now. I'm going to come back to that at 7.1. For this, yes, 5%. Today, we were informed that cost of living is 5.4%. We need that 5%. I talked to a teacher at Watsonville High. She's an agency teacher. She's making eighty to $90,000 a year. Eighty to $90,000 a year, which means that the district is paying 10% at least over that. You can't afford to pay teachers. You're just paying certain teachers. Come on now. Can you please give us the COLA? That's all we're asking. Cola. By the way, this teacher had eight years of experience, so on our pay scale, she would be making what? About 60000 a year? There is not a 60, 78, oh good, look at that. There's not that big a pay difference, and Rel, I know she's getting benefits, and thank you. She's getting benefits. So, please, give us the cola. Give us the cola. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay. 
Good evening, trustees. Dr. Rodriguez, our new student trustee, welcome. Um, I'm Radhika Kirkman. I am the chief negotiator this year for PVFT. Um, and I'm here, I want to do a couple of things. I want to urge the district to sunshine their proposal back to us so that we may begin negotiations in good faith. Um, and I just want to share, I think <clears throat> many of you have heard this, but it's, but it's worth repeating, that this has been a really challenging year for our membership. Um, there's been the trauma of returning to campuses and mental health needs of both the students and the staff. Um, there has been the education gaps that teachers are feeling this immense pressure to address and to, and to actually bring students up to speed. And then there's just been the constant inconsistencies in classrooms with quarantine requirements, which we are thankful for because they keep people safe. But it has made uh, this an incredibly challenging year. Um, it's also even more challenging and impactful when we are consistently losing prep for covering vacancies. So what we hope to do um, in Sunshining is we hope to work with the district. We want to ensure that we are attracting, but most importantly, retaining the quality educators that our students deserve. Um, and we know that the way to do that is by offering a livable and competitive wage in the area. So that's what our goal is. Thank you. Are there any others? No, that's it? Okay. Are there any questions or comments from the board? All right. We will move then move on to item 7.1, our public comment, and this is our opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. And please know that though the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for our non-agendized items, that we are listening. So do we have any public speakers? I do, President Holm. First speaker, Bill Beecher. Good evening. Uh, Madam President, Dr. Rodriguez, trustees and staff. Uh, for three years I've been beating on you to have a meeting and discuss health care costs. Sixty million dollars, let's talk about it. Well, I'm here to tell you I'm going to quit haranguing you because while I was flying for the last several weeks, long hours, I realized that's not the real issue. The real issue is that our health care costs will bankrupt the district. Why do I say that? You have health, raise, rising health care costs and they will double our spending in less than 10 years. And this is based on a counting principle of 72 that at 7% and COVID-19 will raise that, it will take only 10 years to double to $120 million. We do not have the money and we will not we will have to cut jobs and or reduce benefits and or reduce pay. None of these is viable. Willie Hero has proposed that the district copy what the Fremont School District is doing. That's to combine wages and benefits into one compensation package and you let the employees pick the trade-off between health insurance and wages. Don't make it a thing that gets negotiated year after year and everybody loses, both the district and the unions. The board should have an open meeting to discuss the future directions for benefits and wages, total compensation. Give the superintendent direction and freedom to pursue these ideas. Thank you for your time. And can I clarify anything? Travis Walker. Hi there. Um, I just want to say that I found it incredibly disheartening to watch the State of the District video that you played because there definitely is a time and it's never a wrong time to highlight all the great work that our students are doing. When our students are given opportunities, they excel. Uh, what that video left out is the reality of what we're seeing in the classrooms this year. 
Um, about two weeks ago, someone in my department at Watsonville High School went out on medical leave, uh, and normally they would be replaced with a long-term sub, except the district doesn't have any long-term subs because they're already filling in all the vacancies that were there at the beginning of the year. Um, so the reality of what it looks like is for two weeks now, there have been all of their classes sitting on classroom with no work every single day. There's different subs every single period. It's a different teacher. They don't do anything. They're just sitting there. We're babysitting. We're supposed to be educating them. And that is not happening. It's incredibly frustrating to see because this is not what schools are for. We're not daycare. We're here to help our students grow and to learn and excel in whatever future that they choose to do for themselves. And right now, that's not happening in our schools. It's happening in the school, in the classrooms that have teachers, but not all of our classrooms have teachers. And when teachers leave uh, the district for more money, as just this week, a teacher who has been in this district for 24 years took another job in another district, we have more and more vacancies. And if you're not going to do anything to address it, the problem's only going to get worse and worse. Thank you. Sean, you're up. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to start out by saying my name's Sean. I identify as a concerned father, uh, not a domestic terrorist. Um, I'd like to echo what Georgia said and thank you for your service and any other men and women here who fought for our freedoms. Um, I want to start out by uh, asking Dr. Rodriguez a question. So we still have six and seven year olds wearing masks at school. Uh, we think that that's okay. But I wonder how is that okay, but it's also okay for parents to bring snacks into class that are not prepackaged. They're divvying them out and giving them to the students. Each parent's assigned a day. And so once a month, we divvy up snacks. They bring grapes, they bring pretzels, which is great. But how is a mask safe? But that, you know, that's safe, but a mask uh, list is not. Uh, it's just a question. Maybe I'll see it on the next Ask Dr. Rodriguez. Another question I have is why is my seven year old have so much screen time at school? He's limited at screen time at home. He gets more screen time at school than he gets at home. That's concerning to me. He, he shouldn't be on the screen that long. That's what we did last year. I, I'm under the impression that when you're in school, you learn from the teacher, not from a screen. So if he needs screen time, which is understandable, they need to learn technology, then he can get that at home for his homework, and the stuff that the teacher should be working on that they're sending home should potentially be done in the classroom. That's another concern of mine that I would like to ask all of you. So maybe those can be addressed. All right, uh, let's go Brandon. Kayla West. Uh, hello again, board, um, Dr. Rodriguez. Hi, Itzy. <laughs> I'm actually the nurse for new school, so I don't get to see you guys very often, though. Um, that's because I have five schools. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to see people at five different schools, students at five different schools. Um, I have health assistants out at different schools. Um, even when I'm given substitutes, they're, um, they're not trained, so I can't just leave them there. <laughs> I have to train them to be able to be in the health office. I have students with diabetes. I have to cross train these unlicensed people to be able to provide, well, I have to determine if it's appropriate for them to provide the care and then cross train them if, if it's within the doctor's orders. Um, I just feel spread so thin and our health assistants are doing so much with um, COVID with the tracking and the tracing as far as calling parents. Um, that I'm picking up a lot of the things that the health assistants do, and it's just made it really hard. Um, I'm also doing testing because we're not getting the Inspire results um, or the registrations from the parents um, in a timely manner, and so I've ended up doing, um, we're, we're not supposed to be doing the rapid testing, but we are, because um, if we need to test, we need to test. So to say that the nurses aren't doing anything with COVID is, is not accurate. We're also making the calls too with our health assistants. Um, it's, it's just been a lot, and, and I'm not gonna point at this again, but I'll point at this again. <laughs> I'm, I'm working, we're all working so hard, everybody is, but we, we don't have enough staff 
and we're just spread too thin. It, it really is, and I, I appreciate how hard this, the teachers are working too. I, I don't know what I would do without them, but, but we need to be present for our students. I've been a nurse for 28 years. I've been a nurse longer than probably some people here have been alive, and I've been a school nurse for 14 years, and th this just, it breaks my heart. It really does to not be able to give the kids the attention that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Thorne. Okay, where was I? All right, first I'm gonna say to our friend over here that there is no conclusive case of COVID having been spread by food. It spreads airborne. And if you can find documentation, great, but I cannot, and I just looked again, so no. Okay, and the other piece I'm going to say is, where was I? Oh yes, so other people have covered the points I wanna cover. I'm gonna go back to the teachers. Um, out of the 1.2, I think it was, Clint, for the SRO funding, something like that, which was including a bunch of other things in with that funding cost, I believe that only half of that is being allocated for the SROs and the mental health workers. The other half of what you're gonna spend the COLA money on is going towards improved security systems and cameras and things like that. Again, should we really be spending the teacher's COLA money on stuff that you know is infrastructure? Maybe other points can be, other places can be found for that. I still wanna ask why Watsonville City is not helping to pay for an SRO at Watsonville High School. It is right smack in the middle of the city. And by the way, Danny, any time they need our SRO to go and do something, they take them. They call them out. So we don't get reimbursed for the time that they spend off campus doing other things. Maybe we should look at doing some kind of shared funding with the SRO at minimum. Okay? Thank you, Ms. Shocker. I appreciate it. I really do appreciate all the hard work you guys are doing. I really do. Uh, and I know that our teachers are really doing a lot, a lot of hard work too. So please pay them a little bit more. Chris Webb. Uh, I don't want to stay for 10.4, so I'm just going to speak to that now. Um, given that the funds in question there were budgeted for personnel, they should be reallocated to personnel, uh, I suggest in the form of retention bonuses to the relevant teachers, with one payment this year and another for returning teachers in the 2022-2023 school year. The savings in question should not be shifted entirely to facilities, materials, equipment, and professional development. Let's not forget that the teachers in question had salaries so low that they had not even kept up with minimum wage laws. Before, better than a bonus would be a salary schedule increase that didn't leave teachers with personal a personal finance argument to be made for leaving the district to be, say, barista, baristas at Starbucks or some other less stressful job where they're also going to be making minimum wage or near it. We are still in a pandemic and PVUSD choosing to, uh, cho choosing to not acknowledge their, the loyal service of their teachers. Um, they're, by not keeping up with inflation, they're, they're really, they're, they're like Travis said, they're not, they're decreasing our pay. Um, I also wanted to say that the, the district needs to make up for the last time we went to negotiations and they offered us 1% contingent on 98% attendance. Um, uh, this pr is a personal affront to me because district policies here, changes, have led to the undermining of Renaissance's program, and part of that has led to a, a worse attendance. COVID is not the main factor for that, either. Uh, before students were slipping on attendance, they would be addressed with effective interventions right away. And yeah, they might lose the privilege of going on a field trip or going to lunch early, but now it takes weeks for some semblance of effective intervention to come, and the stakes are raised. It's now um, come to school or, or you're gonna go to court or you're gonna not graduate. We had a better system before that um, identified Time. issues early. Thank you. Ralph Howe. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ralph Howe. 
love school psychologists. Thank you for well, hiring me. Whoever hired me. And uh, I'm at Watsonville High School, and I love Watsonville High School. And all my colleagues. Love you guys. Uh, but I'm not just a school psychologist. I don't just diagnose kids to see if they got a learning disability or one of the other 13 things. I'm a peak performance trainer. I'm wearing all this cool stuff. You're going to like this one from Des Moines, Iowa. I know you like that, Drake University, because I'm a USA track and field coach certified. I'm an official as well. I, you know, I got bored during COVID. I, I got to get some more credentials. I got to get some more licenses. I got to do some more stuff. Well, today, I got a chance to teach in a classroom. I taught these kids about the biopsychosocial theory of kind of how we are as human beings, right? Our bodies tell us how we're feeling. And we're not feeling too good a lot of time, right? One out of five kids are depressed. You know, adults, we're depressed, <laughs> stressed out, we need help. But what, the way we do that is through our minds, our thoughts, our self-talk, in our knowledge, and that's kind of what I was trying to present to those students in the class today, and they got it. And also the social activities that we do, that's the social part of it. How we interact with others is 30 so seconds. Important. Oh, good. This takes 30 minutes, usually. <laughs> the other thing I did was peak performance. When stress goes up, performance goes up, a little bit, but then when it's too high, you gotta figure out how to come back down, right? You gotta be free, you have to think positive thoughts, you have to do things that are helpful to your body and do things lovingly to your colleagues and to kids and people you're with. And so that's all I wanted to say. My nickname is RAP, it stands for <laughs> Repeatedly Accentuate the Positive. Hopefully, you'll have a great day today. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Donna LaFever. Hi. Um, I'm a math teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, uh, this is my first year working in the district, but it's my 10th year teaching. Um, coming to this district, I mean, I, I went to Aptos High School as a student, so I wanted to come back. I, wa I always wanted to work in um, this district because I wanted to give back what I received, and it has been really hard to transition into this district. Um, one thing, I had a student come to my class a few weeks ago from lunch. He's on the phone. He came in late. He said, Miss Lefevre, I'm on the phone with my friend. He's in crisis. He's saying that he wants to kill himself. I need to talk to him. I need to stay on the phone with him right now. And I, I had a class full of students that are trying to get work done. And I, I didn't even know what to do for the student, except that I was like, I can write you a pass. You can go maybe to the nurse and find someone that might be able to help you walk, talk through this conversation. Uh, he, he told me, you know, my friend, he's gone through therapy, he's tried, nothing helps. And so this kid is here taking on responsibilities that we have failed the kids, what we as adults have failed them. If we can't be supporting the kids that are in the most dire need right now. Um, so that was, it, was, it was such a hard day and I didn't know what to do for the student. He comes in, he's on the phone. I mean, he's dealing with this, he's 15. And I have other students that have come into my class and they've got scars up their arms. I mean, they're, they're, there's extreme trauma and depression out there that I want to be able to give them as much as I can, but it is so hard. The class sizes are so big. I'm burning out. And I really want to echo the concern. I mean, I don't agree with everything that you said, but I do agree that the screen time is too much. Um, it happens because our our class sizes are too big and teachers can't manage. And so cr computers have been sent to us to try and alleviate the fact that our class sizes are so big. And it's, it's just not helping. It's not helping their emotional state. It's not helping them learn. And the way that you can reduce those class sizes is getting more teachers into our district. And the only way to make that happen is to increase the pay, to make sure that people want to come in and be teachers. Because there aren't people that want to be teachers right now. It's too hard. And so we don't time. have people. 
So that's what I think we need to do. Make sure that we can get the pay higher for teachers so we can get our class sizes smaller and support our kids. Thank you, everyone. All right, so on to item eight, our employee organization comments. So this is the time where we hear from our employee organization. So each will have five minutes and we'll start with PVFT. Good evening, good evening. Okay, I only have five minutes. I think I should have more. Um, uh, okay, so a regular sentiment that we're hearing this year, we're hearing it now, is that teaching is even more emotionally, mentally, and physically difficult. Teachers are addressing the social emotional needs of students whilst delivering rigorous academic lessons to meet the goalposts that the district has put in place to address and close the learning gaps our students present with. Teachers are also helping students build their stamina in attending lessons, working on projects, setting and meeting goals, and following classroom etiquette. All of this also requires the student to reconnect with such social etiquette such as interpersonal skills and conflict resolution. Seeing this in writing, one would think, isn't this what teachers do daily? Yeah, it is, because you know teachers are amazing. <laughs> but this year, the social emotional need and health and safety of our learning communities is overwhelming. As educators listen and guide their students towards, towards rebuilding their sense of a belonging to a community that they have been isolated from for a year and a half. We are asking our teachers to meet benchmark data points set by the district despite the child's emotional need. We are following safety protocols that can potentially sometimes create daily absences amongst the teaching staff, leaving a classroom in need of a teacher. This causes other teachers to lose out on their prep time to prepare, grade, communicate, and collaborate with their classroom for what their classroom needs. At some sites, there are still a significant number of vacancies that are compounded by daily absences. Thus, teachers are th at those sites lose out on their prep time on a more regular basis. This is a serious issue at Watsonville High and at PB High. So when we look at where failure lies, this is something that was recently asked of me by a media outlet. It is a huge question. The failure lies within the system. We need to fund public education. Educators are, are paid meager wages. Their time is micromanaged to an extreme that the district's response to us when we asked to provide for our teachers some more needed prep time or protecting some time. The response is that the teachers just don't know how to manage their time. Instead of adjusting, sympathizing, and allowing for, for a teacher to address the interruptions that their classes may experience when they suddenly are, find themselves having to address emotional needs of, from our, of our students, the teachers are blamed for being a couple lessons behind. And then here, as you witnessed tonight from Mr. Beecher, you know, you hear at these meetings the cost of health care for educators. This is then used, used as fuel to prevent an increase on the salary schedule. The COLA is a cost of living adjustment to meet the needs of inflation in the area. In this area, it's incredibly expensive. There should not be an argument as to where to vote on where to put that money. It goes on salary schedules. We cannot address the whole student and the whole community if we don't have teachers, highly qualified teachers in the classroom. You can't always just tout a, all these wonderful programs that, yeah, they, there's a, so much potential, but we need the teacher in the classroom to implement these programs, to deliver these programs to our students, to help guide them through their education. So the failure within our district has been this continued disconnect between them and the educators. Our district failed to heed our demands to provide a raise on the salary schedule before the school year started. It took several months for them to even consider putting a bonus, a meager one at that, to compete with surrounding districts in hiring teachers by offering this bonus, which is as flaccid as our salary schedule. We have placed 16 teachers on uh, who are on special release in classrooms to address the vacancies. But we are still faced with over 20 vacancies. And we are still faced with teachers who are 
continuing to resign from this district. So the expectation now is that we, the PBFT, have to fight for a raise on the salary schedule. And I wanna just make it clear that when we fight for anything for our, on our, that is based on, that goes into our contract language or on, for our salary schedule, anything that we advocate for, everything that we ask for is for our students. They are the founding basis for, what, for why we exist to advocate for improving our workload, our benefits and, and total compensation package. Because we care about our students, we have many teachers who care so much and are giving so much time and taking time away from their families. And they are exhausted. And it shouldn't be that way. Well, Education time. should not be a begging, a, a venue where we're constantly begging to live in our communities. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CSEA? Okay. Do we have anyone from Pavam? Good evening, Trustee Holm, trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm here to speak with you um, on behalf of Pavam. And I want you to know, our teachers are working hard, classified employees are working very hard, but so are managers. And you know what, they're accepting the challenges every day. Just kind of doing it, trying to figure it out. Many are in classrooms doing all these things, but you know what, we've got a good, strong management team. And I'm, I think uh, Dr. Rodriguez has made sure that people are ready to go and in great positions. So I'm here to tell you that Thank you for being supportive of us. We need that support. And to talk to you a little bit about um, adult education because we have a couple events coming up. One, as you know, is the Rio de Heart um, dedication on November the 9th, and I hope you can join us there. Uh, we're getting ready, we're excited. It's going to, um, it's, takes, it's a community effort here because we've had to work with transportation, Dr. Rodriguez, um, facilities, everybody trying to get the setup, and it's going to be in the parking lot uh, down at the, at the front of adult education. So we hope you can join us for that event. I appreciate you coming to the Community Advisory Council when you can. I know Trustee Shocker was there. It's nice to have that support, and we, we appreciate it. And then I guess the last thing I would say is November 11th, Trustee Acosta brought it up. The Watsonville Community Band, which is under adult education, will be doing a concert there in the Mellow Center. So on behalf of Pavan, thank you very much. We greatly appreciate your support, and the management team is ready for your challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CWA? All right. We will move on to item 9.1, our approval of elementary and secondary schools emergency relief the ESSER 3 expenditure plan. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez? Yes, thanks so much. So um, ESSER, if you could put up the presentation, that would be great. Yeah, I need the clicker, please. So one thing that has been happening um, throughout the state and nation is, is some strengthening of the requirements on ESSER funding and the requirements of school districts to be able to provide a plan of how that funding was used according to the requirements. So one of the things that came out recently was our requirement um, for us to have that plan in place and be able to address and, and showed in a detail way how we supported all the fiscal requirements and also how we're linking that um, to LCAP funding. So one thing that's important to know is ESSER is one-time monies and so therefore one of the requirements is how are we showing that we are aligning it with not only community input but also our LCAP or local control accountability plan and how are we doing that in an effort to support students. And so there are guys 
guidelines. Um, these, this funding is specifically expires September 30th of 2024. And there are seven categories in which we can spend those, those monies. Um, and so you see them according to the icons up there. Um, those are the seven areas. We did have a special board study session where we spoke to some of this. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit more in depth um, today. So how do we gather that input? So we, what we have been doing throughout this time is really looking at how, what does our community want, um, our students, our staff, and our um, families and community. So we had several multiple opportunities to do that. So we have expanded learning opportunities grant. We had a thought exchange um, where you see we had 405 people engage in that. Um, we also had um, two two different surveys. So we had a survey that ran between July 6, 20, um, to July 21st, and we had 708 people respond to that. Um, we did do an additional survey, um, SR3 survey, which ran between September 3rd and October 4th, and we um, had 471 responses. So during those times, as always, I present at each DLAC and so um, and other parent meetings and so we, I also presented during those opportunities. And so some of those responses are from those meetings. We also specifically held town halls in English and Spanish. So we had some that, that were um, done completely in English and then we had some that are done completely in Spanish. That's another strategy that we're using that's different that we started last year where we're not having um, translation occurring, but we're actually holding the sessions in in English and then holding the sessions in Spanish. So that actually is happening this week. So on Monday night, um, we held in Spanish the College and Career Readiness, and we're doing it in English on Thursday. We did a town hall last night um, in Spanish on vaccinations, and we will be doing the English on Thursday. So we're what we're finding is that it's better for parents because we're able to focus in just one language. I also meet weekly with staff um, during their Wednesdays on something called conversations with the superintendent. And so they actually saw this exact slide and then they produce posters um, based on areas within these expenditures um, that they felt were important. And so that help, happens weekly with me um, at different school sites um, throughout the district. And so this is in ranked order. So you can see the categories in which um, they were ranked and suggested. So as you heard um, from many um, people during their comments, mental health services and support has been um, since May of last year to now um, continues to be the top ranked um, request for how we use the ESSER funding. And so mental health services and supports, and so um, that is why there have been the increase in all the different areas. Um, the second um, has been supports for vulnerable populations, so whether it's um, English learners, foster youth, special education, um, students of poverty, those are, that's the second ranked. Um, third has been facilities repairs and improvements. Um, fourth, um, learning loss among school and among students, and then um, summer learning and supplemental after school programs. Um, so community uh, top input, um, this is what we received from the September survey and from the conversations from superintendent. So I do um, want to thank um thank um Clint and his his office for um transcribing all of what's been on the posters. Um, they, you know, it's it's a, a lot of work um, to, to do that, and so I, I appreciate that. Um, and you'll see in rank order what it is. You will see that a lot of it is linked, is very similar um, to the areas. So these were top input. These aren't categories, but these are specific items um, in which they asked for. Um, so additional tutoring support was number one. Site repairs, um, we are seeing when it comes to community, there is a, a larger request 
um, for site repairs, um, Chromebooks and hotspots for students, so continuing to support that, um, continue additional intervention teachers, improving air quality, um, expanding partnerships, adding additional um, campus supervisor, which is um, was part of that 1.2 million, so um, we have put six additional campus supervisors on um, in this last um, month, and they are um, at full capacity at this point. Um, staff to strengthen MTSS, which again stands for multi-tiered systems of support, additional social emotional counseling, and um, additional general education instructional aids. So as you all know, with the ELO money, so the expanded learning opportunity grant money, um, we hired um, we hired 32 additional instructional assistants for general ed, and they all have been hired and are within the classrooms at this point, um, supporting. TK, which is transitional kinder, kinder, and um, first grade. Um, and so what did we hear and how did we address it? So um, as you just saw, the number one was additional tutoring supports and opportunities for students. So we're in the process of reconfiguring spaces to open up our community learning hubs at all of our high school campuses, including our alternate ed. So ITSE will be happy. It's also at New School and it's at Renaissance as well. Um, we are doing, um, working to the continuation of the instructional aids. So um, you ask a TK kinder and first grade teacher and they will say that the instructional aids have been a significant support. So we're gonna be continuing that. that is also a direction of the board to not have it end um, next year. So if you remember, ELO is a very limited term, and so then the request was to maintain that. Um, knowing that this is one-time funding, the ELO was one-time funding, and this is one-time funding as well. Um, support through partnerships, um, so that's everything from Life Lab, Digital Nest, um, Latino Youth, and um, El Sistema, or just to name a few of them. Um, also, we did allocate additional funding, so you know, I'm, I know you know that we did seven weeks of summer school this last year, and we intend to continue to provide that additional um, time. And then also the continuation of virtual academy. So going back to how can we use this money to help our ending fund balance and our general fund, um, one thing that we're able to do is to pay for all of the staffing out of Virtual Academy out of this funding source. So in essence, what we were able to do is free up 2.3 million worth of general fund money in order to be able to um, support this program. Number two is site repairs, and so as you know, um, you have uh, you approved $22 million being funded to support district-wide facilities. I think we found with this rain um, the benefits of all the um, roofs, the brand new roofs that we've done, and the detriment of the ones that we have yet to do, which is why you all um, put aside um, for at least um, six million of that to go towards roofing, um, because we know that um, nothing is secure if we don't wind up um, having our, our roofs done. Um, so continuing on additional staff to strengthen MTSS, so we have allocated an additional almost $1.2 million in mental health clinicians and social emotional counselors. And then we are um, going to be having additional staff at the Family Engagement and Wellness Center. We've been meeting extensively on that with our partners. I'm really excited because we will be open December 15th for our families. So when we go off on break, um, they will have still have those supports during our three week break and on Saturday. Days. Um, and then we did, um, everyone knows we do a Chromebook refresh, so we have to have that expense. And so we're again trying to be strategic on how we're using one time monies. So instead of needing to use one t our general fund for a known um, expense that's coming up, we did use this funding source um, for that Chromebook refresh. Um, and then um, we did wind up um, hearing um, to have the funding for campus security and resource officers. Um, we did have um, 
very few write-ins. We had the ability for people to write in. Um, the grand majority of those um, were around um, safety of some sort, and um, specifically the SROs. Um, so how are we going to support this plan with other funding? So we do have other funding that's coming in. Um, so we have some additional Title I concentration com funding coming. Um, that's actually going to allow us to be able to pay for the ongoing instructional aids and intervention teachers past 2024. Um, so we know that we'll be able to do that. Um, this specifically is talking, because it's the requirement, this is ESSER 3. So what I'm referring to right here is ESSER 3. We did receive ESSER 2 monies as well. And so you may say, well, I, we approved 30 million. We didn't approve 22 million for facilities. Well, 8 million of that will come out of ESSER 2 funding. Um, and so you'll see um, everything that we used um, ESSER 2 funding for. And then I've already done multiple presentations on the Expand and Learning Opportunities Grant, but you could see what is funded. Um, what we are funding through um, the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant. And um, so I will take any questions that the board has. Do we have any uh, public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. Nellie? Hi, good evening, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to point out that yes, while um, ESSER 3 funding can be used for the Wellness Center. Um, there is $3 million, uh, $3 billion that the governor has um, allocated for the um, implementation of, of community schools. And so I, we have asked um, the district if they have applied for this community school funding and their response was no. So why not? Why not use community school monies as opposed to just going right to this? The money from the ESSER 3 could be used elsewhere. So there is money for community schools, your wellness center, that meets the definition of a community school, outside partners um, at a school site. So wouldn't it be more um, effective to use money that the dis that the the state has available that is outside of this funding so that's my question um our national um, teachers union the american federation of teachers has developed an in-depth in-depth training series about the implementation of um, creating an implementation of community schools so if you would like to talk about that um you know how to get a hold of me thank you um and yeah, it's hard when I don't have enough time during my union time to speak, but I will come back in a few minutes, I guess. All right, do I have any discussion from the board? Trustee Dodge Jr.? I just have a, a quick question. Um, I received an email today from Minnie White about the portables leaking over the last week's storm. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a Measure L question or an ESSER funds. Um, what are we doing to help the portables in many ways? Yes, yeah, so the, the the bid did go out. It actually came out a million dollars over bid. And so because of that, it went back to the architects for um, revisions. And it's now currently in DSA and will probably start construction in March at this point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Trustee Roscoe, did you have a question? Yeah, I, could you address some of the, um, or the idea behind that additional funding and why we're not pursuing it? The community schools? Sure. It makes sense to me that we would yeah. try to apply for as yeah. much funding so, as possible. So the so the the wellness center is specifically going to be established for non-school times. So the goal of the wellness center is not to create a wellness center or a clinic within the schools, but it's to actually have that available to parents and families um, on non-school times. Um, and so there will be an alternate.
alternate schedule where they will be open from 12 to 8 and they will be open on Saturdays um, and so because of that the community it's not necessarily that we're against the idea of a community school but the whole premise of this is to provide families those offerings and wraparound services when normally a school is not available and so um, that's our whole premise is around expanding supports to families. We often hear that families can't get to somewhere by 4 p.m., that they can't get to us when it is a weekday. And so because of that, those services will be open to them um, on non-school hours. So we are looking to um, expand, right, um, those wellness centers. And that could take time, right, especially when we're uh, obviously looking for funding to be able to fund those different wellness centers. And it requires staff. And also it requires um, partnerships with community mm -hmm. partners. So would it make sense to possibly apply and have something like that in place while we are up and running? So I'm not gonna speak directly to all the requirements of the community school tonight um, because it's not an agendized item and we're oh. actually speaking to Sorry. this. Um, but um, what I will say is that um, we need to first and foremost get our current um, school clinics up and running before we add on additional. And our community partners, um, including Salud para la Gente, are having equal challenges with yeah. staffing and so we have current clinics um, which are currently not open and so um, we can definitely address it in further information for, um, for board. Sure, thank you for that. Yeah. And um, going back to the ESSER fund, so you did point out um, that there will be a savings of 2.3 million. Can you go back to the slide please? Um, so that's money that's going to increase our general fund and could potentially be used for other things, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, Clint will address that during our first interim. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Vice President Shocker. <laughs> yes. Um, so I just want to go back. So our ESSER funds are being used to fund campus security and the SROs, not COLA? That's correct. So we, we continue to have a, a misunderstanding. So COLA was not received last year. Um, so we received COLA this year. And all the funding that we've been referring to is not COLA. It is um, one-time funding is what we've been having conversations about. And then I think what, just to, just to punctuate, um, once one-time funding is gone, then, and I stated this at, at the, Mar the September 15th, which is why I think it's coming up, once the one-time funding is gone, of course, it has to come from somewhere, which will be the general fund. Okay, thank you for clarifying that point. And, um, Answer my question about portables. Um, we've started bid projects for some of the other facilities, right, with the roofing and everything, so yeah. that we can get those projects underway. Yeah, you all approved um, projects at the last board meeting as well, okay. in order to get the projects underway. And each one of these projects has been a pretty, um, a pretty laborious action. So Clint and his team for each one had to get a pre-approval, and so he has received approval for. The majority of those projects, he had to submit an ESSER plan for pre approval for each facility project. Okay. And then we'll also, you mentioned, just I want to clarify it for everyone. Um, 
that we will be able to keep intervention teachers and IAs in the classroom beyond our 2024, which we had mentioned in SR originally. Yeah, so we, we received an increase in Title I in concentration funding, which requires, requires us to go over and above. Um, and so um, the instructional aides and intervention teachers fit that bill, and so we will be able to use um, that funding. And I mean, technically, everything winds up affecting the general fund, but it will specifically come out of there. Okay, and last question. So our community center, this includes the um, wellness center at EA Hall, but we haven't looked at including cost of our other wellness centers yet. Currently, we are on, we've only funded out of ESSER at this point for the staffing at the EA Hall's um, site at this point, yes. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. I have a couple follow-up questions, if I may. Sure. Sure. Just to further clarify this ESSER funding, and I know um, Clint addressed this question too at the board meeting where we approved where it's, uh, the funding was going to be allocated. Could ESSER funds be used for like one-time bonuses? So they, it must be one of these categories. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify that based on the language, that's what we can put those other funds towards. Mm -hmm. And what we have done to be creative and strategic is we have taken some things that we knew would hit the general fund and we have used allowable ESSER funding for those general fund expenses so we could have that funding available for other areas. For other areas that we could, that could be potentially part of the conversation that we have at the negotiating table. Yeah, we don't talk about negotiations outside the I'm table. I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know, but that's part <laughs> but of it. But it is right. available funding that we can use for other things, yes. Right. Thank you. Um, and then one last thing, and maybe this could be unrelated. Um, Duncan Holbert, they needed those additional portables. So mm -hmm. can you provide um, an update on that and when we stand with that process? Um, yes, we'll, we'll send it. We'll give it to you. Thank you. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa? So I'm wondering if um, some of the, um, the district ride facility repairs would meet criteria for any match that might come down the pike. I know we had multiple projects already that I thought we had put in a queue to get reimbursed from the state and then the state held. I actually haven't had an update or we haven't had an update on all of that in a long time. It's 9.10. Oh, good. <laughs> um, well, I know the bond. Yeah, I know the bond is but that will, on there. I'll, I'll be speaking You'll to be, how oh, much okay. is on our wait That's list. That's great. Yeah. Will any of these ESSER fund projects also be, could be in line for some of those matching? So any, any ESSER project has to be um, so any of these projects, some of them could. So it has to be for a learning teaching space. So it's, if it's anything that's not a learning space, a classroom space, the answer is no. So the roofs don't fall um, It depends where the roof is, right? Okay, thank you. So sometimes we're doing the roofing like of an office, which are a main office, which then wouldn't include. Okay, yeah. thanks, and I'll wait for comments at the next yeah. I'll, I'll hit you. Okay, thanks. I'll hit you. <laughs> um, so I know for the facilities we talked about, you know, ESSER funds, but the two and the threes, that it, that's a total of uh, 30, 30 million. Mm -hmm. Can you remind me, like, in terms of, like, the deferred maintenance, like, I remember when we were talking about some of our bond stuff, like, what is our, like, the, th the projects that we've been waiting on for some time, like, what is the estimate at this point of like some of those projects, like that the bulk of those projects? For deferred maintenance? Oh, how much it yeah. is? Um, that's in there too. So okay. it's over 300 million if we were to do everything. Okay. Thank we you. have over 300 million worth yeah. of projects. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Can I have, if there's no further discussion, can I have a motion? I move to approve. All right, I have a first, do I have a second? A second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion carries unanimously. All right, item 9.2, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, PVFT, Sunshine Proposal to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District for Collective Bargaining Agreement Negotiations 2021-2022 school year. Allison? Sorry, I'm not trying to make the titles long. <laughs> um, yes, good evening, President Home, uh, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. As we heard in the public hearing, um, we do have a Sunshine proposal from PBFT to PBUSD for reopeners for the 21-2022 school year. Um, and they are wanting to Sunshine the Wages and Related Matters article. Um, and so I request that the board approve their Sunshine proposal tonight, please. Great. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. Chris Webb. Um, I just want to urge the district to move swiftly to sunshine their own proposal after this, uh, one that reflects caring as much as the forthcoming PVFT proposal does, and the present uh, misappropriation of COLA funds into the general fund from the state does not reflect a sense, a sense of caring from PVSD, nor does the elimination of COVID leave, nor the lack of rapid tests in the event of positive cases. Uh, therefore, as part of the district's sunshine proposal, forthcoming. They should consider m mitigating future turnover by moving to change the contract to stipulate that COLA funds from the state be applied to the salary schedules of district personnel as intended by the state as a matter of course. Until PVSD takes p meaningful action to demonstrate caring as such, I cannot wear the district provided PVSD care shirt because it would not seem authentic enough for me to wear before my students. I would also add that if PBSD has funding to spend on shirts and on SROs, whether they're from SR funds or otherwise, then they have money to provide PBSD students with teachers who can afford to live in the neighborhoods where they reside. PBSD can afford to provide a long overdue raise. If the district is going to argue that the steps on the salary schedule constitute raises, then they should have their CBO present to this board to show that the steps in the salary schedule keep up with inflation. And otherwise, realize that salaries that don't keep up with inflation constitute a uh, annual pay cut in real terms. And as such, it's no wonder we have vacancies. Thank you. Nelly. Feeling at how you said my name. Hi, again. Um, yes, yeah, so we will hopefully be able to start bargaining as soon as the district does their sunshine um, and we can get through this. This is bargaining only for this year. That's what this is about, just for this year. You know the monies that are coming into this district, um, and so it's just for this year. You know that there is $9 million added to the base funding. Again, I've said it in the past that um, a 1% raise with all taxes, all statutories, everything, all the bells and whistles for our unit, that's our entire unit, the people that we represent, is just under a million dollars. Nine million dollars, just under a million dollars. A 5% would be like five million dollars of the nine million. So, um, there's that. And, um, our healthcare, the premium went up by just 2%. Yes, um, healthcare costs are outrageous. Again, not something that should be asked of our educators to pull from one pocket to put into another. What eventually becomes a pay cut. We want teachers to come and stay in this district. We want them to be able to afford housing. We have an item on the agenda 9.4 for um, a resolution to acknowledge the wonderful work that our school psychologists do. Uh, we value all of the people that we represent. Our school psychologists are pretty awesome. Um, my sister is a school psychologist. Um, and we want them to stay here as well. They, they benefit from the raise that we advocate for for our students and our students benefit. Our students are the ones that benefit. Another item, 10.9, I know it's going to go over a little bit. 10.9 um, is for a consultant contract for special ed. This person is going to get paid $95 an hour. A beginning psychologist year one is making um, less than half of that than that per hour. So that's pretty sad. We're paying a consultant $95 an hour. No, they're not, you're not even yeah, blinking time. an eye. But you can't 
offer a raise on the salary schedule to get people employed, to build the connections that our students need. Thank you. Travis. Hey there. Um, I had two more things I wanted to mention. Um, multiple times tonight I've heard the uh, socio-emotional needs of our students come up. Uh, in the video it mentioned something along the lines of uh, our district is working to provide support for students' socio-emotional development. Just today or yesterday, I had yet another student come to me with socio-emotional uh, needs because they could not get to the socio-emotional counselor. They could not access them. When I spoke to my classes about how um, they felt like their needs were or were not being met by this district, that was their number one concern. Um, a more honest version of that video would talk about how the district chose to spend funds on bringing police onto campus and criminalizing students rather than providing them with the socio-emotional support that they actually need. Why are you trying to expand the current program to provide services for people after school when the programs that we have in place to provide socio-emotional service for students during school hours are not working? Um, secondly, I wanted to touch on the vacancy number. The district has been using this number of 20 vacancies. That is just dishonest. Does it count teachers who had to give up their prep to cover another class to fill for vacancies and they're teaching a 1.2 now? It doesn't. Does it count the TOSAs who were brought back into the classroom? It doesn't. Those TOSAs who were pulled for their positions and forced into teaching positions were told that their assignment was temporary. If they're on temporary assignment to fill a vacancy, that's still a vacancy. So either you were dishonest with the TOSAs when you forced them back into the classroom, that their time there was going to be temporary, or you're being dishonest by not counting those positions as still vacancies. Both of those things can't be true. Love to know which one of those is the case. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? All right, if I'd like to make a motion to approve. A second. All right. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Um, item 9.3, approved job description and management salary schedule, coordinator migrant extended learning program. Report will be presented by Luis Medina, our director of migrant education. Is it on? Yeah. President Holmes, uh, Holm, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, distinguished members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to present the position of Migrant Education Coordinator of Standard Learning. In 2020, 2021, Migrant Education went through a federal program monitor review process. The FPM found, uh, found us out of compliance in the section of Migrant Education item number 13. This has to do with the uh, with our supplemental migrant services and us not uh, providing adequate supplemental services to migrant students in the areas of math and English, and not meeting the California Department of Education migrant measurable uh, program objectives and POs. Uh, this was mostly true for the uh, secondary levels. A question that was asked by CDE and the FPM reviewer to our program during the final evaluation process was if we were providing the curriculum and the lesson plans to the teachers that are working uh, for us to uh, providing supplemental services. The answer was no for some of those programs. As a migrant program, we have never had a coordinator of migrant and student learning program, at least not during my tenure. Before my time as director of the migrant program and during my first year as director, most of the migrant services were being delivered during the regular school hours with full-time migrant teachers at the K-12 levels. Because of this, in 2014, we were found out of compliance by the FPM. According to the FPM findings, we were not providing supplemental services to our migrant students. We were directed to provide most of our services after school on Saturdays, winters, and summers. As a result of this, we, we found ourselves in the position of having to eliminate most of our certificated staff at the elementary level. 
Up to this date, we have not hired anyone to assist to fully implement all of the uh, mandates that the uh, CDE and E in order to stay in compliance. Uh, since the uh, finding in 2014, we have implemented a number of great programs such as after school services in, in, in English and math in most of our K-3 grades. We've, we have also successfully implemented salary academies, speech and debate, boys and girls in engineering through Cabrillo, the ROV program, some residential programs such as EPIC at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, increased our college tutor program through pupils program, and added five migrant instruction assistants to support our K-2 second migrant students. We have also added two parent support specialists to support our migrant families. And this school year, we have two additional certificated staff members to support our secondary level students. Our priority has always been to hire staff members that will provide quality direct service to our migrant students and their families. We have accomplished quite a bit, but we can, do, but we can still do more. To meet CDE migrant education national program objectives and the needs of the migrant student and uh, student population, we have been asking some of our all migrant staff to work on curriculum that meets the California standards in math and English development. We must also provide curriculum that includes integrated ELD, complete a student pre and post assessment for all of our migrant programs, and make sure that uh, the lessons and uh, the lesson plans include highly engaging and culturally relevant curriculum. We must also provide professional development to all of our supplemental staff for the curriculum that we offer and provide the necessary support to all of the supplemental teachers throughout the school year for all the after school programs, Saturday academies, uh, winter programs, and summer programs. We have always known that we were in need of this position. However, as a federal funded program, we are limited to a 15% administrative cost. In the last three years as a program, we eliminated the uh, pupils coordinator position, the migrant tech support position, and the migrant staff accountant. All of this to stay within our 15%. We keep asking our staff and certificated migrant staff to do more every year to continue to be able to meet the needs of our students and comply with CDE and E goals and objectives. When the CDE, ME, and the FPM recommendation was made to add this position, the first thing that I mentioned to them was that this will put us over the 15% admin cost. Since, since this position will not, be, uh, will not be providing direct service to migrant students, my consultant actually agreed with me. However, because this is a very fundamental need to our success of our program, they agreed to waive the position salary and not count it as part of the admin cost, like a couple of other essential positions that we have. I truly believe that by adding this position to our migrant program, it will greatly benefit our migrant students, improve the quality of our service, and meet, the, uh, meet all of the CDE migrant education measure program objectives. It will also facilitate the uh, recruitment of highly qualified bilingual teachers that will be willing to work for our program, knowing that we are providing the necessary tools for them to deliver a high quality curriculum to our migrant students. The funding for this position will be 100% out of the federal migrant grant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? No speakers. Any discussion from the board? Hey, Dale. All right. I have one question. Um, is the waiver temporarily or would it be indefinitely? Not as far as I know. If they waive it, it's, it should be permanent. Great. Well, I'm full, in, I'm full support of um, approving this tonight, not only because I benefited from many of the initiatives brought forth by the migrant um, program uh, here in PBUSD, but because I see the benefit. Um, due to the various uh, and new initiatives that have been implemented over the years. So you have my full support and I'll ha be happy to make a motion. Great. Um, are there any further discussion or can I have a second? Our Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, just a, a quick a quick question. Uh, Director Luis Medina, I know your passion, your dedication and all your years to Watsonville. And how do, how do I explain this to people? You know, they, they see management and right away, you know, why another, why another manager, why another someone just managing? What, what, what do I, what do I tell the people? The uh, the answer that I can that I can give is that the um, um, 
two reasons. Uh, we've been found out of compliance a couple of times by the FEM. The, uh, and the reason was because the, uh, we're, we do not have the uh, uh, personnel that can actually run all the programs that we have. Uh, we've been hiring um, teachers to do some of the uh, curriculum, to do some of the uh, pre and the post, and to run some of our program uh, assignment, pro including uh, winter programs. But every year is, uh, it's a different person. The, uh, we never have the, uh, um, the consistency of having somebody that will run um, and manage the, because uh, I'm not a, a curriculum person and I never pretend to be one. Um, and, and I'm always looking for qualified people to be able to do that. And, and we've been doing our best. Uh, but the way that you can explain is that the, uh, the uh, position will bring quality to our program. The uh, students will benefit. Uh, something that I mentioned, and, and the, uh, maybe I shouldn't have been saying, the, uh, um, if a migrant student is doing better, mm -hmm. then everybody else uh, improves. The, uh, um, and something that the, uh, um, and, and people know me, the, uh, if we offer a program, and it's a high quality program, and it's for migrant students, but there is a need for other uh, non-migrant students to be part of it, we have always say yes. Mm -hmm. Because everybody will benefit. Uh, we want everybody to benefit with the programs that we offer. The, uh, it's not going to be 100% non-migrant student because we do have a, a, a mandate that we must uh, provide services to migrant students. But well, we're pretty open. And the, uh, uh, if the quality of the program improves, then the quality of the education for our migrant students is going to improve. Okay. Thank you very much, and I, I know the great work that Migrant Ed does. You know, I, I see what you guys at, did at Hall School, and, and so I'd like to go ahead and second that motion. And Danny, I think I would just add one thing, if I may. Um, Luis did mention that um, as part of the work that he's has, he has done to uh, remain under the 15%, he has had cut to cut some uh, administrative positions. So that's one thing. And the other thing, Danny, is that this is not eating up money from our general fund, is through the migrant grant. So, you know, that, that's just additional um, information that I think community uh, will find helpful. And, and it's the, uh, uh, just to make things, uh, kind of level things up, the uh, bigger regions that have bigger budgets, the, uh, they're able to actually be able to uh, actually hire people that can run those programs. But because we're at lower uh, uh, at lower budgets, the uh, it's difficult for us to be able to actually hire people to run programs because the uh, because of the 15% admin cost. Uh, just as an example, my salary with benefits and the um, and having the uh, um, um, couple of other programs, uh, the indirect cost and the direct cost and all of that, it almost gets me to that point that I'm at 15%. Right now, I'm at 14.1%. With that, that position, and the, uh, if that would, if I would have kept the uh, the uh, um, the tech person, if I would have kept the uh, the uh, staff accountant, we probably would have been at 18, 19 percent. So those are decisions that we need to make in order to make our program work and to be in compliance. The uh, but by cutting those positions, we're making everybody else do more yeah. to be able to uh, accomplish what the state is asking us to do. Thank you very much. I have a question. Thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, you talked about administration costs having to be under 15%. Has the program ever looked at trying to petition to get that 15% raise? I've been, uh, I've been every year. I, that's one of my biggest complaints, not just me, the other directors as well uh, mm -hmm. from, the, from the state. We asked the uh, maybe they should, the uh, maybe the, because uh, they do have a couple of items within the uh, program. The um, health uh, component, the apparent component, and the identification recruitment doesn't count. That's, that's, that's waived and doesn't count towards the admin cost. But one item that we've been asking is the indirect cost. That, that should be waived because we have no control over that. Uh, last year it was uh, 4.14, if I'm correct. And this year is 3.56, I think. So just by doing that, the, uh, our admin costs are, um, the, we were actually have an extra $30,000 that we can spend just because of that. But if net zero goes to 4.1 or 4.2, then our admin cost is gonna go automatically without us having done anything to actually raise it. But it's based on whatever formula decision somebody makes, this is the indirect cost and this is how much we're gonna have no control over that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Trustee Deserpa. Um, I read this um, 
I've read the backup with great interest because it's it was sort of shocking to me that like that this position would have to create curricula. It seems to me like doesn't the state have a history of creating curricula just like this? Like why do we have to reinvent the wheel? Yeah, and it's we do ask seriously that question to the, uh, even even for professional development. Yeah, there are certain areas that we must comply with uh, in terms of professional development. In terms of the. Uh, um, um, the, uh, what's the one? The other one, the uh, cultural relevant uh, curriculum, and, and why doesn't the state just provide that for everybody without us having to actually be able to uh, having to actually find somebody that will be doing that? Since every every right, they make it like a mandate, but then they provide nothing, nothing and then everyone's to, doing their own thing, do our own thing, and there's thing. no yes. standard. No. That's what drives no. me insane. So anyway, mm -hmm. I'm in full support. Thank you. All right, well, we have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion, you're welcome. Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to item 9.4, resolution 21-22-17, our school psychologist week resolution. Well, it will be presented by Heather Gorman. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I am very happy tonight to be standing in front of you to present this resolution. So during the week of November 8th through 12th, 2021, schools throughout the United States will celebrate National School Psychology Week. The following resolution speaks to the work that the school psychologists do for PVUSD. I'm presenting this resolution this evening to highlight the work and dedication of the school psychologists. This year, the National Association of School Psychologists theme is Let's Get Into Gear. The theme's acronym provides a challenge to grow, both personally and professionally. It encourages us to engage in best practices and advocate for children's access to mental health and learning supports. And lastly, to rise, which implies resilience, and renewal despite the challenges of the past and the present. So, I won't read all of it, but I've highlighted a few. Whereas one way to draw attention to the importance of school psychology services and children's mental health is to have a resolution commending the work of Pajaro Valley Unified School District School Psychologist. And whereas one of the missions of, of PVUSD is to empower school psychologists by advancing practices to improve learning behavior and mental health for all children and youth. And whereas the provision of comprehensive school psychology serves, services reduces barriers to accessing mental and behavioral health services and underserved children, Many benefit from these professional services, engaging students at all levels of learning and development to promote personal achievement, growth, and resilience, as well as a sense of connectedness and well being. Whereas sound psychology principles are integral to instruction and learning, social and emotional development, prevention, early intervention, and school safety and supporting culturally diverse student populations. And therefore, we would like to suggest, or I would like to suggest, that the Board of Trustees of Pajaro Valley Unified School District do here pry, proclaim November 8th through 12th, 2021, as National School Psychology Awareness Week. The Board recognizes and celebrates school psychologists for the impact they have on the lives of our students and families and their positive impact on our community through tireless efforts. All right, thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. Marie Stone. <sighs> Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, President Holm. Vice President Shocker, board members, and community. My name is Marie Stone, and I am one of PVUSD's dedicated school psychologists. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Heather Gorman for presenting action item 9.4, the resolution highlighting the work 
and dedication of the school psychologist. And thank you board for including this resolution in tonight's agenda. The resolution is titled, Acknowledging National School Psychology Awareness Week. Acknowledging means to recognize the fact or importance or quality of something or someone. It is nice to be acknowledged, but I would like the board to acknowledge us with action and not words. I am here to ask the board to acknowledge our invaluable contributions 365 days a year, not just one week. I am here to ask the board to acknowledge our importance by always making sure we have a livable and competitive salary. I am here to ask the board to acknowledge our importance by maintaining our quality health benefits. I ask the board to be creative and think outside the box when looking for ways to save money. And I ask the board to not be complicit during contract negotiations and to advocate for the very people who show up every day and work tirelessly for our students. And I ask the board to do this, not only for the school psychologists, but for all of my classified and certificated colleagues. Thank you. Alyssa? Hello, my name is Alyssa Maisano, and it is my first year as a school psychologist in this district. I did email the board, but wanted to reiterate my message tonight. Thank you for the resolution of appreciation for School Psychologist Week. Following up what my, what my colleagues have shared, the pay and benefits are invaluable. There are currently over 200 open school psychologist positions in the state. Um, in our county, PVSD's benefits are well known. When I was looking for a new district to join with an unemployed husband, the Benefits package was ultimately the deciding factor in my decision to join this district. Um, I left my last district because I did not feel valued, and one clear way to make people feel valued and appreciated is with compensation and benefits. Thank you for your time. Do we have any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? Thanks, Heather, for um, bringing this forward. And to our brand new school psychologist, thank you for choosing Pajaro Valley. This is a very special place to work. Um, we feel like we're a family. Um, the, the students really deserve the highest quality that we could provide. My kid's dad was a school psychologist, so I know a lot about what you do. And it's not just the counseling support that you do. Um, typically, you get credentialed in two areas, and um, or three, right? School counseling, school psychology, and PPS. So three, three areas. I don't know. My um, former husband went to Humboldt, where they had a great program. Um, but you guys do the counseling support. You help staff. You're working with parents. You're doing psychometric testing. You're analyzing it. You're writing the reports. You're you serve on a student study team, um, and you're doing behavioral interventions all the time too, with staff and teaching. And so I know what you do very deeply, and I want to thank you, um, thank you for what you do for this district and for all the children. Thanks. Anyone else? I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I'll second. I've got a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 9.5, uh, approve change order number two for Aptos Junior High School MPR Improvement Project. Uh, the report will be presented by Gary Webb. Our Director of Maintenance and Operations. Thank you, President Holm. Good evening, um, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Um, I'd like to address item 9.5 on the agenda, approved change order number two for Aptos Junior High School NPR Improvement Project number 8112. Um, this is a multi-part change order. Item number one, with the installation of the new athletic wood floor, the floor level will be raised by several inches. This altitude change required relocation of electrical at the new stage wheelchair lift, raising the athletic pads on the walls and reframing a, reframing a staircase and handrail 
to get onto these stage, these, these changes um, keep these areas compliant and functional. That cost is $23,950.46. Item number two, reconfiguration of the locker rooms and restrooms left several areas of existing HVAC and electrical conduit exposed. Um, these items and covers, this item covers the cost to protect and fasten those to new locations on the new wall that's being built. That cost is 16479 Item three, during the demolition of the existing bathroom tile, there were chunks of chunks removed from the CME walls. These walls must be patched flat as they are exposed finishes. That cost is 11344 Item number four, excavation for the bathroom concrete pour. There was an underground conduit that was cut. Discovery was necessary to see what the conduit ran to and powered. Once this was complete, the time it took to complete the repair had pushed back the other trades by several days. This item is the cost of the discovery and the contractor's general conditions for lengthening the time on site for phase one. That cost is $14,660. Uh, the total cost for the change order request is $66,435.01. That's 5.15% of our uh, increase to the overall cost of the project. Uh, well within our 10% of our contingent, uh, contingency for change orders. It, uh, it was budgeted in the original contract. Um, so we recommend that the board approve this change order. Thank you, Gary. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No. Public speakers. Do we have any discussion from the board? I just have one question. Go ahead. How close are we to finishing the project. Uh, this is this is winding up phase one. There's phase two, which is the installation of lockers and flooring. Mm -hmm. So we're just, just wrapping up phase one with this. Okay, so how long? I how don't long have the, the you don't have any completion idea. time. Okay, thank you. How are you doing, Gary? I'm doing well, how are you? Good. Uh, can you refresh my memory in the initial uh, change orders, what the scope was on that one? Um, I didn't present that to the board, and I don't recall the exact um, change orders in the first round. I'm sorry for that. All right. I can speak that. Yeah, I think Clint can refresh us. I'm sorry. I didn't hear. Hey, thanks, Oscar. Um, the first one was when we did originally discover that that was cut underneath the flooring was the initial replacement of that flooring. This is now the additional work on top of that original change order. Okay. The reason I'm saying is this is the reason I posed that question the last time because I knew this was going to happen. And this is, this is just an example of, you know, what happens on a job site. So to answer Trustee uh, Shocker's question, it, it's gonna extend the job some now because there's, the work's gonna be a little more extensive. So they might go over their timeline. Do we have uh, penalties if, if they do go over those timelines? I'm sure that's all worked into the contracts, correct? That is worked into the contracts, correct. Okay, all right. So yeah, it's gonna take longer now. So so the project will be done according to the update provided last week on Feb by February 10th. I just was wondering if that was still the time frame. Yeah. Right, thank you. And I just wanted to, you know, say thank you for presenting on this. And you know, it's like even though it's still in that contingency, we wanted to be transparent with the public and the community. So. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, is there any further discussion from the board? <laughs> All right, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Item. Yeah, you, you, you yeah, yeah, it's still you. So, uh, item 9.6, uh, 196 uh, architect agreement, Landmark Elementary School admin uh, re roof and repair project. It is still you, Gary.
All right, do we have any public speakers to this item? No speakers. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? You know, I looked at like many of these items and the architectural um, expenses seem to be incredibly high. Like this is not like a new construction, right? This is just They're based Fifty-five thousand dollars. They're based on percentage of the estimated total cost of the project. Yeah. That's crazy. It is unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Trustee so, Soto. Yeah. So it's usually about ten percent, correct? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just just so that everybody understands, that on, you know, contracts, it's, it's kind of like a retainer just to get them going. Trustee mm Junior. -hmm. Do we predict any type of mold damage? Are we seeing any type of mold damage? Because I know in that area, for a long time, you know, being in the wetland and PV had some mold issues. Do we foresee any of that happening? In, in this particular instance, we don't have mold at this point. That's what we're aiming to prevent. That's why this is under extra funding because it's going to directly impact the indoor air quality. We we did a lot of uh, sheetrock. Not we. I wasn't here at the time, but. Uh, the group did a, a lot of work on sheetrock removal mm -hmm. and, and uh, clean up work in there already, so it's important to get this roof done as quickly as possible to avoid that. Thank you. Anyone, uh, Trustee Orozco? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, item 9.7, Architect Agreement, Ohlone Elementary School Admin and MPR Reroof Project. Gary, still you. Thank you again. Uh, I have the next two of these, so hopefully we'll go quick. This is another uh, architectural agreement with uh, 196 Architectural Firm. This is Ohlone Elementary School Admin. It's the tile roof area, primarily over the the problem area right now is over the admin area, but we do have leaks out on the campus on that tile roof. Um, this is also an Escher, Escher Fund project. The estimated construction cost is 2.25 or yeah, 2.25 million. Um, the project compensation is 191,260 dollars. And we recommend that the board approve this agreement. Thank you. Any public speakers to this item? No speakers. Any discussion from the board? Go ahead, Trustee Soto. My two cents, as usual. Um, this is going to address the cricket behind the bell tower, correct? I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're referring to. So the bell tower above the office, that vaulted area, mm -hmm. um, when I was here as maintenance supervisor, we had a lot of issues with that area leaking. And the reason was is because the cricket, which is basically a smaller roof formed behind the walls that where the, the roof line and the wall of that bell tower meet mm -hmm. in order to divert, to divert the water away from the sides, there's a structure called a cricket that's built behind it. So basically that cricket that's there is too small to handle the load of water flowing off of that roof. So my question is, are they gonna improve that cricket to make it larger to accommodate the amount of water flowing off of that roof based on the pitch? That's and That's why they have that, that drain pipe kind of attached to yeah, so what would happen was is the water would infiltrate um, inside the bell tower because it's just all bare plywood. Uh, so all the flashing was failing uh, along, this, along the backside, along the edges. Because of that cricket being so small, the amount of water would just flood that wall and go right through there. Yeah, so I'm hoping they address that and make it bigger to handle the, the amount of water coming off of there. I can tell you that I certainly appreciate that information, and, I, and I'll take that to the yeah. team to make sure that we, we look at that very carefully. Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with what's going on there, and, and it is one of my schools, too, so I, I greatly appreciate it. Well, hopefully we stay in communication and we make sure that I Yeah, let me know how it goes. We'll stay in touch. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right, can I have a motion? I move to approve. I'll second. All right, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 
9.8, the 19.6 Architect Agreement, uh, Renaissance High School Paving Project 8160. And the report will be presented by the man of the nine o'clock hour, uh, Gary Webb. Thank you again, President Hall and Board of Trustees. So we recommend that the board approve this agreement. Great. Uh, any public speakers? Yes, Chris Webb. Anyone else? All right, any discussion from the board? All right, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve this item. I'll, I'll second that. I, I would like just to say it's just a tremendous amount of money to do a repaving project. I mean, anyway, <laughs> that's all. Okay. You have a first and second. All right, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, item 9.9, .9, selection of Climatech for RFQP uh, 041621, our infrastructure modernization and utility savings program assessment. We get to have somebody different, so. Thank you very much for going the title of the RFQP. Yes. Thank you. to evaluate the district's energy consumption and systems to create savings that can be utilized for a future energy modernization projects. So just a little bit about the process that we used. It's a request for qualifications and uh, proposals. We received a total of five from, from qualified energy service contractors. Out of those five, three were selected as finalists and they were scored and interviewed by um, a district panel. Climatech scored the highest out of all of those finalists and also scored the highest across all categories that we evaluated. Um, so the item for your consideration and approval tonight is the selection of Climatech to begin that audit process. And what that will include uh, to start off with would be meetings with district staff to identify energy goals for the district, uh, to identify priority projects. Um, a couple that are kind of towards the top of the list right now are the, um, the power outage sites uh, that have been experiencing power outages due to um, lines being tripped and sparked and, and shutting down school sites. Not worried? Okay, I'll just talk a little bit louder. Um, so uh, part of that assessment also includes establishment of uh, baseline energy consumption across the district, um, and then an inventory and evaluation of all of our systems to, to evaluate the age, um, look at what we have as standards and what are things that, that aren't saving us money or, or helping us out. So those systems would include lighting, HVAC, building controls, water management, and any other kinds of utilities that we um, So with that,
with your approval then tonight, it would allow us to have our kickoff meeting in the next week or so to, to get started on identifying those areas that we want to get, get started with. And um, the services that they're going to perform for the, um, the audit and assessment carry no cost to the district, which is um, always great. Um, so, and it's a collaborative process. Part of what they will provide are um, updates and um, information to, to our staff as well as to the board on, on you know, where we're at in the process. And um, any future projects that are going to you know, come with a scope and a fee will come back to the board for approval. And with that, I can take any questions on the process. And um, Rob Redding from Climatech is here tonight too. So if you have any Climatech questions, um, he'd be more than happy to address those as well. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No speakers. Do we have any uh, questions or comments from the board? Just one. I'm just happy that we're prioritizing those areas that have lost power. I know that Calabasas and um, Bradley, Bradley have been severely affected yep. um, and we're still getting emails about that. Um, so just thank you for uh, looking out uh, for those schools and prioritizing those needs. Okay. Um, does this have the potential to also help lower our carbon footprint as a district? Um, I'm sure it does. Um, Gary yes. Yeah. <laughs> We have experts in the room that could, you know, really address that. Um, but again, uh, the, the, the first step is going through the assessment process to identify the ways that we can do that. And then those projects would come back and, you know, we would ask for your approval for, for any kind of scope that we develop and, um, and move forward with. Thank you. I have one ask. Mm -hmm. So once the assessment is completed, is there a way that the green team can access that information? Because I know we are taking inventory. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that would be information that would be helpful, I think, for the team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is going to be a partnership, right? So they've um, been, Climate Tech has worked with um, with neighboring districts, Santa Cruz City Schools. Um, I got to visit uh, the San Benito High School campus and see some of the work that, that they've done with Hollister. And um, it's all um, tied into learning and, and being, uh, you know, a great district partner, right? Not just to mm -hmm. create and complete projects, but to make it really something that um, has a value for a long time for, for the district. So, yeah. And I just wanted to add, um, kind of echo Trustee Orozco's comments about just appreciating, you know, especially for our, our schools that are having issues with their, their power. I know that I have been, um, you know, in conversations with PG&E, with, you know, people from uh, assembly members, uh, Revis and Stone's office on trying to find solutions. And I, I just appreciate all the steps that are happening to, you know, mm -hmm. resolve these issues and, and, and you know, the district-wide benefit as well. So um, thank you. All right. So we have, um, we don't have a first. I'll make a motion to approve. <laughs> All right. So I'll I have second. a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Item 9.10, Resolution 2122-18, Support of Assembly Bill Number 75, Kindergarten Community Colleges Public Education Facilities Bond Act of 2022. Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you very much. So as you have heard, um, we continue to put apply significant amount of our one-time funds um, to projects. Um, the reason for that is when we looked at how much um, facility needs we need, um, we have a $300 million need at this point. Um, and that is, I want to note, that's after expending um, the grand majority of our Major L monies, and that's after expending um, the $30 million worth of one-time funds that we've put in there. So what has ha been happening, and um, you hear me say this frequently, but is not something that is unique to PVUSD. So statewide, there is significant facility needs throughout the state and so what has happened is although monies has been placed for towards facility bonds at a state level that's been quickly taken up and so we currently do have um, we're on that waiting list 
interest. We have currently $7.8 million in state matching funds, which is waiting for us. That would, in essence, give us that money to be able to reinvest into our facilities. And so um, this, this uh, um, resolution is for just the board to show the support of the assembly and the assembly's belief in trying to allocate some of the additional funds that California has at this point um, to be able to put towards um, kindergarten through community college public education funding. Um, we believe that this would not only benefit the state in general, but more importantly benefit PVUSC because hopefully we would get a portion, um, if not all of that $7.8 million, depending on how much they put towards it, obviously. Um, and so um, just the other thing that I would um, just, just note is that um, this would allow, um, they're currently, if you look at the second to last whereas there currently is a backlog of unfunded needs of three billion dollars statewide so um, we are part of that right um, we are part of that billion um, group so we're 7.8 million um, but statewide um, there is three billion dollars worth of need out there and so um, all many schools throughout the state are aging as are many of our projects and as we know and um, I'm actually proud of all the work that we've done on the roofs. We did have some challenges with the rains, but if you remember probably four or five years ago when we had our first major rain, um, we would have had um, many, many more um, causes of concern raising, um, and a lot of that is because the board took additional one-time monies that we received several years ago and allocated $19 million towards facilities at that time, and the majority of that went towards roofs. So um, we're requesting that you support this resolution in support of Assembly Bill 75. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No speakers. All right, any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge, Jr.? I would just like, hopefully, we could put Mini White and Radcliffe Elementary Schools at the top. Uh, they're almost 75 to 100 years old, so I'm in full support of this action item tonight. Thank you very much. All right, any other comments? I have a comment. Go ahead. I just wanted to reiterate, because I know public's listening to this, but this will not affect local property taxes. I think it's important mm -hmm. yeah. to mention that. Yes, thank you very much for mentioning that. Yes, um, so this will this is using um, additional funds that the state actually has. So the state was assuming that taxes were going to be worse than they actually came in, actually came in better. So a lot of our taxes is built off of the high higher level for the state, the higher level t um, tax bracket and more property tax and more income actually came in than predicted. So these are some of these funds that would be allocated towards facilities and not affect us um, in any negative way. So thank you for saying that. Okay. I have a question. Do we know who uh, who's authoring this bill or who's pushing this forward? Um. Assembly um, member, I don't think it, it's on the resolution. Yeah, I just want to send them a thank you note. Um, it, um, <laughs> I, I did originally, but I, I, I'll have to get back to you. I don't remember yeah. at this time. I, I just think it's uh, obviously a huge need in the community, and it's not just at two of our schools. I think all of our schools really need maintenance. Yeah. So I think if we do end up getting this money, I think we need to look at all facilities. Thank you. And with that, I'll make a motion to approve this item. O'Donnell. All right. O'Donnell. O'Donnell and Adina. O'Donnell. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'll okay. second. Okay, so I've got a first and I've got a second. And um, I'd just like to say that I've been also pressuring our local politicians to please put some pressure on the state to provide this. Um, we really do not want to saddle our taxpayers with more debt, and this would be um, greatly needed. And in fact, I wish it were a higher sum because we really, all of, all of the schools across California need help. It's not fair to the local taxpayers to have to do that. So you have a first, you have a second. I'd like to point out that uh, Ms. Acosta is away from her seat for this vote. Okay. 
All right, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Motion carries 6-0-1. All right, we'll go on to item uh, 10, our consent agenda. Um, consent, uh, uh, consent items are routine items coming before the board. Do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? No public speaker. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Yes. Okay. 10.13, let me make sure I have the right number. So pull 10.13. Extended Learning Department. Yep. Okay. Um, so 10.13 and all right, so can I have a motion for the remainder of the items? I'll make, I'll a, make a motion to approve the yeah. consent agenda items that presented polling 10 or deferring item 10.13. A second. Okay. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 6-0-1. Um, so going on to item 11, which is our deferred consent agenda items, so 10.13. Yes, I just wanted to um, acknowledge um, our partnership with Watsonville Wetlands Watch and how important that it is that we continue this partnership. Um, we live in a diverse area and we have many students, many community, commu I can't talk right now <laughs> either, Jennifer. <laughs> community members interested in protecting our wetlands and learning more about how wetlands work. And this project um, gives that opportunity to many students that otherwise wouldn't have an opportunity to learn um, about the wetlands, um, not only on school sites, but they also are great partners with summer camp camps, so I think um, they deserve some recognition, so that's why I wanted to pull it. Okay. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve. All right, so I've got a first. Do I have a second? I'll second. I've got a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, all right, so with item 13.1, our, uh, our action and report on closed session items. Are there any items to report? Yes. First off, I'd like to make a motion on closed session item 2.1. I move to approve certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on October 27th, 2021 with four and seven additional action items. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, next, closed session item 2.2. .2. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on October 27th, 2021 with five and 12 additional action items. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 2.5, special education settlement for a student. The board voted with a 5-1-1 vote to approve the final settlement agreement, agreement for special services student. All right. Okay, and I also have some announcements to make. Announcement number one, Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Rafael Ruiz as a new assistant principal at Watsonville High School. Mr. Ruiz is a product of the PVUSD schools, having attended Alianza, Rolling Hills Middle School, and Watsonville High. He obtained his bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary studies from National University and a multi-subject credential from Cal State Tech. He has recently completed his master's in educational administration from national as well. Rafael has spent the last eight years teaching eighth grade language arts and social studies at Cesar Chavez Middle School. In addition, he has been an after school coordinator, a coach for a variety of athletic teams, and on the PBIS and school safety teams. These experiences will serve him well in his new role. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to his new administrative role. Number two, on behalf of superintendent and district administration, we are pleased to announce Mr. Khan Connor Bayouk's promotion to senior project manager, facilities bond program. Connor has worked for the Parho Valley Unified School District for two and a half years as a planning specialist and brought with him years of diverse experience in operations and project management in the construction field. He is a passionate team player who is quick to learn, problem solve, and serve in any area needed to improve district facilities. 
He handles challenging situations with grace and professionalism. We are proud to promote Mr. Bayouk to our senior project manager. He looks forward to serving the district and continuing the good work of improving facilities in his new role. And then I will not be at the November 17th board meeting. However, Dr. Rodriguez will try to zoom me in. All right. <laughs> and, our, and our next, uh, our next meeting will be on November 17th, uh, 2021. And with that, our non-extended meeting is adjourned at 929. <laughs>